My name's Tom Manners, that's my Twitter handle, that's my email address, that's me pre-lockdown. Um, let's tell you about me, as much as I do this every week, I am an NCTM professional development lead. I'm the PGC tutor for maths at Arthur Terry Teaching School. If you know anyone who wants to train to be a maths teacher in the West Midlands, come, get them to come join me. Or actually, if you want to be a teacher at all, come and join Arthur Terry. It's a brilliant place. I love working there. Um, for the other couple of days a week, I'm a daddy and I also work as a consultant for two days a week. So I'm fortunate enough to be invited into schools. But part of that time uh, involves work with the NCTM. Uh, I'm a teaching for mastery specialist, teaching for mastery um, through the Central Maths Hub. And um, the reason I do all this now is because of my work with the Maths Hubs. And so every week I'm going to do these sessions. I'm going to remind you that there are 40 now Maths Hubs. Three new ones have been announced in the last week or two. Uh, and if you have not signed up for your local hub, please go to mathshubs.org.uk. The reason I am now as passionate I am about maths education is because of the work I do with the Maths Hubs. It's really inspired me. Um, when I first met Steve Lomax, who, re who leads the Grow Maths Hub, he changed my thinking entirely and he made it. Made it, made it easy in many ways. So please, uh, wherever you're teaching within England, sign up for your local maths hub. So the maths hub, when we're doing our teaching for mastery, again, it's inverted commas, watch my first video as to why I keep doing that. Um, five big ideas and here they are. So teaching for mastery, we look at mathematical thinking, the top right, fluency variation, probably my favorite representation and structure. And certainly today's session is looking at representation and structure quite a bit. So what's today's uh, session going to include? My face again, apparently. Uh, this session will introduce bar modelling and its advantages uh, across a number of topics, actually, we'll demonstrate it. Uh, and so I'm going to have to get you to have a go and just sit back and relax for, uh, occasionally. I think four times I'm going to get you to have a go. I'm going to attempt to use some Cuisinaire rods. I'm using the word attempt and I'll explain why shortly, along some bar models and examples. And we'll consider how to develop problem solving as a part of bar, um, no, pardon, develop problem solving as part of bar modeling, but also some kind of separate um, considerations as to how to improve problem solving in your classrooms. As always, I hope you find the ideas interesting. I hope you want to use some of them. And I'm hoping, though, that's something you don't like and you think about it and go, no, I don't like that. But I know I can do something better. And if we all do that, if we always go away and think about our pedagogy, that's one of the most important things we can be doing. Um, so as a reminder, people, um, I can, I've got things popping up on my screen. If people could please turn off their uh, cameras and whatnot and turn off their mics, uh, that would be fantastic. So then, uh, an anecdotal evidence example. Um, I found this um, blog online. I thought it was really nice. So I'm going to share every link I share, uh, I speak about today, I'm going to share at the end of today. Um, so I will put them all on at the very, very end. So don't worry about trying to write them all down. Every link I, and every um, thing I refer to will be shared at the end. So a very interesting blog on bar modeling. And he had this question, five sevenths of a number is 35. What is the number? And the point of this question, of course, students who are just taught the algorithm, they'll see the fraction, they'll say five sevenths there, they'll see 35, and they're gonna just find uh, five sevenths of 35. Because um, when they see the question, all they see is divide by the bottom, time by the top, uh, and that's what they tend to do. But there it is, the bar model. There are seven parts there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And five of them equal 35. I wonder if I got the right answer to that there. I don't know. Um, but there's the anecdotal example from Mr. D. Busby, a really good blog, by the way. Uh, when I gave my year 11 set one, the summer 2017 AQA higher paper, more than half of them, including students who go on to get sevens and eights, answered this wrongly. And that's because, going back to this, this kind of sentence here, if we teach them algorithms without really understanding behind it, or maybe visualising the concept before you answer the question, they're just going to see the numbers and think, oh, it's my, turn to, it's my time to repeat that algorithm. And so representing it like this is really, really useful. Make sure they realise, ah, five sevenths is 35. So each seventh must be worth seven. Um, really enjoyed that bar model um, uh, blog so I, again I'll be sharing that at the very very end. Um, I've got to remind people if you've got any questions it pops up on my screen but I don't, I can't read them if you've got any questions throughout uh, they will please put them in the chat box. Adam, producer Adam's doing that today and can you all wave and just say even though I told you to turn off your cameras because it's Adam's birthday so Adam thank you very much for doing today fella happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. A reminder, of course, I always go back to these no matter what session I ever do, um, because the assessment objectives are, are, are what we teach to. And I ignorantly, I remember four years ago, my, my head challenged me what the assessment objectives were in maths. And I was like, oh, they're numer, number and ratio. And I hadn't looked at these in enough details. And they're such useful sentences. And we talk about conceptual understanding nearly every week now. 
because pupils have to develop conceptual understanding and bar modeling is really, really powerful to do that. I refer to this most weeks as well, uh, the Improving Mathematics in Key Stage 2 and 3 Guidance Report from the Education and Down uh, Foundation, uh, and look at them at their eight recommendations. There's number two, use manipulatives and representations to help bring out the concept. Uh, but also, it, it, it does this, using bar models develops pupils' independence and motivation. This is taken from, uh, um, what's it called again? Um, Mastering Mathematics, I think it is. I just got it here. Yes, it is from Helen Jewelry. Used well manipulatives and with it representations, can enable pupils to inquire themselves, becoming independent learners and thinkers, because they can play with it and they consider and they can move things. And so we give them the opportunity to explore themselves when we're using manipulatives. And um, really good book, certainly for those who are primary colleagues, an excellent book, that one. An example of how I've used it, I teach in secondary schools, as much as I really want to talk in a, teach in a middle school or maybe a primary school. Um, I have used this a couple of times with different classes to get them to understand the power of bar modeling. So looking at this situation here, Anna and Bob shared some money in the ratio two to three. Now looking at question A, so in fact, you know what, let's just make the diagram first. There's the diagram, so two blocks, if you like, the American call them blocks, uh, and Bob, three blocks. If the total shared was 60 pounds, what else can you work out? And in this example here, well, let's be honest, who put money on pupils immediately adding two plus three to get five and then dividing six by 60 by five, no matter what the question says, because they're used to the ratio, oh, I know this is one of those ratio questions, two, three, five parts, 60, 60 divided by five. The same things happen when they just get used to these algorithms. Now this, these, the idea of bar modeling really, when we're looking at problem solving, I'll be a bit more particular about this later on, spend some more time on it, is that question mark. And we think, well, what is it I'm trying to work out? Now, admittedly, in this question, I've purposely um, put the example of what else can you work out? Um, but let's just talk about these. Question A, Anna and Bob, all of the blocks equal 60. We're told that all the blocks, the total is 60. So therefore, each block is worth 12 pounds. So what else can I work out? I can say that Anna's worth uh, got 24 quid. I can say Bob's got 36 pounds. I can say Bob's got 12 more pounds than Anna. There's quite a lot we can work out. What about if Anna receives 60 pounds? Question B. Well, now I know each block is worth 30 pounds, which means I know Bob has got 90 pounds, which means I know Bob has got 30 more pounds. And I, uh, again, what's the total? That's interesting. The total is now 300. No, it's not. It's terrible maths. It's now 150. So being able to represent it in this way really makes very clear what else could be going on and making sure with a question mark when you're given a specific question you put it in the right place that is what the people are trying to find out if bob receives 60 pounds what happens now we know each block is now worth 20 pounds so we know anna's got 40 we know the total is 100 yes we do uh, so that's useful and if bob receives 60 more pounds than anna, than anna for this question each block is worth 60 the total's 300 anna's got 120 bob's got 180 so much more information and we can discuss it and use reasoning uh, and of course that's the second assessment objective of our um, national curriculum so how did the bar model become so popular well in the night until the 1980s singapore students performed very poorly in mathematics uh, the, the, the these are from the the tins uh, international tests that they do and you can see Singapore suddenly jumping up in the 1990s. Uh, the MOE, it mentions there, that's the Ministry of Ed Education for Singapore and they decided to use research to, to rejuvenate, rejuvenate how they taught mathematics and other subjects as well. They used Dean's research and constructively active learning, i.e. manipulatives, but it was very clear from that research and Dean's made it clear mere use of concrete materials is not enough. And that's where people started to link the concrete to the abstract. But in fact, there was more work from Bruno who looked at the concrete pictorial abstract, the manipulatives, the drawing representation, and then the abstract form that we see, of course, in exams and that we traditionally see. Polya's belief, uh, the king of problem solving, I'll refer to him a little bit later on in his book, How to Solve It. Um, Polya's belief that problem solving is key to every student, of course it is, because we want people to be able to conjecture, to consider, to try things. People's, people's are naturally problem solvers. We crush that <laughs> over time in school, but they want to solve problems from a young age. Skip's work on instrumental understanding, rules without reasons, the algorithms I'm referring to earlier on, uh, versus relational understanding, knowing not only what method, but why did it work? Um, and the Cockcroft Report, um, written in 1982, also proposed the use of manipulatives. And the Ministry of Education in Singapore took all this, this, this research and created their new 
um, mathematics uh, curriculum, uh, syllabus, if you like, and it was focused on problem solving. And on the right hand side here, we see the words reasoning, communication, making connections, uh, all words that we use also in the um, five big ideas for teaching for mastery from the NCTM. And look what happened uh, in 2015, the 2019 results aren't out yet, but in 2015, Singapore destroyed everybody at grade four, that's year five here, I think, and then in grade eight as well. You can see the comparison when it comes to uh, England as well. Um, looking at that, they have advanced, high, and the intermediate, and it's all levels, including the low level. The low level, if you want to put it that way. Um, look at the performance that people have been able to, um, at all levels, how they've improved all mathematical knowledge. Performance, I should say. Uh, these are the PISA rankings in 2015. Yes, I've cheated. I know the 2019 results came out and Singapore dropped to number two behind Shanghai. But that's where I refer back to the NCTM because NCTM do a lot of work with the Shanghai approach and using Singapore approaches as well. And they're the top two in the, in the world right now. And that's why I enjoy so much that I learned so much from the NCTM. And they are the five big ideas that, as I say, Shanghai and Singapore uh, do influence and you know I've got nearly 250 people here listening at the moment and I'm sure at least two or three or four or five of you are saying well we can't repeat what they do here no we can't we take the good ideas that would work in our system and there are plenty of those that we can use representation and structure one of the five big ideas exposes the structure pulls out that concept and the key difficulty point and there are some key representations which students will meet over and over again and we uh, today I'm going to use um, some counters because well, I want kids to get used to those for different topics but I'll use bar modeling but there are lots of different topics we can use bar modeling for algebra tiles we want them to be uh, fluent at using those and so when you introduce these uh, representations if you introduce bar modeling and, and algebra tiles don't rush it don't just here's x here's three well you've got to give them a chance to understand what algebra tiles do you take at least a couple of lessons if not longer to introduce bar modeling to introduce algebra tiles in year seven pattern and structure are related Students may have seen a pattern because you see an algorithm and it works and it happens, but understanding why, well, the structure certainly comes from that. But of course, the first time I ever started trying to do any training or bar modeling, I'd have that same response from staff along the lines of, students need to be able to do the maths without the representation. This isn't to replace the abstract. This is to support knowledge of the abstract. Why is that not working? Oh, don't crash on me. There we go. I was worried for a second. Um, can I use a, a, another example of why we should encourage the use of bar modeling? This comes from a research paper in 2005, I think. Uh, Laura had $240. She spent five eighths of it. How much money did she have left? What I've done is the drawing here. And as you can see, we're told there's five eighths. And so Laura, I've, I've put it into eight blocks. We're told all of the blocks equal 240. How much money did she have left? Notice where I put the question mark. The question mark is the remaining three. Again, how many times do we know pupils would see five eighths of 240 and not read the question? And this is where it break, uh, breaks down the support for pupils here to make sure that they're taking their time to say, what is it I'm being asked to do? Represent the question first, answer it second, not try and do everything straight away. And in this, in this example here, we've got uh, eight blocks, um, 240 in total, so each one equals 30, and we want three blocks worth, so Laura had $90 left. Now, why am I using this? 2004, this paper came from Singapore, 78% of kids got this right, the Americans, 25% of it got it right. And why is Singapore su so successful? Because they've been taught to use this bar modeling from an early age, which enabled pupils to access the structure of the mathematics, to actually understand what the question is asking us to do. And with the aid of these simple strip diagrams, as Beckman calls them, uh, children can use straightforward reasoning to solve many challenging story problems conceptually. Uh, another paper from Tony Gardner, this question here, um, I was going to remove this, I'm surprised I didn't, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, fresh apricots have a moisture content of 80% when left in the sun. To dry, they then lose 75%. Now, I'll just look at what this says here. 50 schools sent their best four mathematicians from year 10 from selective and non-selective schools, this was done in Birmingham, uh, and not a single pupil obtained the right answer. But can I represent this problem? Well, I can quite easily, because there's 100%. I broke, broke them into 10 blocks, each representing 10%. Have a moisture content of 80%. So there we go, the ones that just highlighted there. That's 80%. Now, when left in the sun to dry, they lose 75% of that moisture. So that's 75% of the 80%. Let me just make that a bit, a bit clearer. 75% of the 
a really interesting paper actually a number of questions and why mathematics has to be taught and it's about process content actually process isn't what we want it's the content of the mathematics and that's where bar modeling really really helps there can be different types of bar models to consider i'll make some of them quite explicit today and some might just happen we'll see parts whole or comparative types additive or multiplication perhaps uh, before and after models i've certainly got an example of that during today but there are different uses of bar models to consider we represent the structure of the maths and to help us understand it but as, a, as promised within my very, very long title for today's session, it's also as a tool for bar modeling. And I'm going to hopefully get through both of those in the, I'm hoping it should, it should be under 90 minutes. So we start with algebra uh, and let's go into representation of algebra. And I'm going to start with an AQA GCSE question, which I really like. Uh, you are given that P equals M plus five. Which of the following is true? Now I'm assuming this is a one marker and I couldn't find the national results on this and I, I will look it up for another time because uh, I'd love to know how many people's got this wrong. Because I'm gonna show you how very, very simple this question is when using bar modeling. But in fact, this is a sentence, I only put this in an hour ago. I changed the presentation at nine o'clock this morning. Show me what the problem may look like. Notice how I'm trying to slow children down. I don't want the answer yet. Show me what the problem may look like. And that's something that really will help us for problem solving. Can we represent what we've been given first? Then we'll discuss the answer. Don't rush straight to the answer. What does the problem look like? Now, I referred to this already, Bruno's research on concrete pictorial abstract, and this is incredibly popular in primary schools, yet doesn't seem to be yet in secondary. And the reason I've uh, put that there, because I want to remind you about these things, they're called quiz and air rods. Um, and they are the concrete version if you like there are other versions but the concrete version of bar modeling um these the, this um professional development pack here is available on the nctm website uh, there's also videos as well and i'm going to suggest we watch a couple of them today because i think it will help uh, and as much as i was everyone was mentioning they didn't know where my tabs were yes i did and this is the video i'm going to watch for two minutes if a student asked you this question what would you tell them could you answer it easily? Let's find out what Cuisinair rods are. Cuisinair rods are proportional number sticks. The rods range from 1 cm to 10 cm in length in increments of 1 cm. Each length is represented by a different colour. You need to recognise colours to use the rods, but you can make adjustments to help teachers and students with colour vision deficiencies. For example, you can use the standard rod names. And you can label each rod with its color abbreviation. While the rods have a set length, they can be assigned different number values that are relative to one another. For example, if white represents 3, then orange represents 30. Because there are no numeral markings, any sized rod can be chosen as the unit. For example, if yellow is 2, then orange is 4, and white is 0 0.4. It is the relationships between the rods, rather than any values they have been assigned, where the most power lies. You can create a train by placing two or more rods end to end. For example, red plus light green plus yellow is equal to orange. This relationship can be written using the symbols for the rods. Here's a recap of what Cuisinair rods are. There I am. Okay, um, I wanted to share that because part of the reason I'm doing a lot of these things is to make sure that everyone knows these resources are out there and for free. And that available, uh, that is available on the NCTM website. There's about four or five videos on there. And I'll refer back to this pretty quickly. So those are the quiz and air rods. I am in no way going to suggest I'm an expert with these. Um, and there's a very good reason. I'm colorblind. And no matter how many sessions I've been to on these things, I get confused about them. And I, I can see the power in them. I'm even going to try and use them in a minute. Um, but I'll tell you the story as to my preparation for today as well. But because I'm colorblind, I struggle with these. So what I have done in the past is um, print out a little kind of uh, a side sheet with this exact, this exact page so I could look at them. That said, um, let's go to the question we we're going to try. Uh, I'm going to jump a few screens quickly. Uh, I'm going to try and use these quiz and errors. So you're given that P equals M plus five, which of the following is true? Now I'm hoping you can see my camera now and I've used some quiz and errors here. 
Uh, when I was preparing this, uh, I, I told myself that black equals yellow plus pink. Uh, then I looked back at the grid and realized that actually that's apparently red. Uh, so these things happen. Uh, and, and I struggle with the colors, so it does put me off just a little bit. Now I'm hoping on screen you can see the question there. We know that P equals M plus five. Now I can play with this and I can actually move the Cuisinaires myself though. So does M, so this one here, equal P plus five? So there's the P and I'll put that on top. I can see very quickly that they don't. They, that, that they aren't the same length. This length from here going, uh, going to the right, the yellow here or the M stops here. What's P plus five ends over there? They're not equal. The next one, M plus P equals five. So let's put those together. Again, the pupils are able to be independent and explore themselves and, and reason and say, well, that doesn't make sense. So we'll try the next one. M, so just put it back to its original situation. Uh, M equals five minus P. Awkward, bit awkward because, let, well, in fact, let's put five down first. Now, we know on a number line, so if we start at zero, so add five. Okay, so I've got that there. If you're taking away P, that's going that way. So that would be that journey here. Now, the start point was the zero. So does M equal five minus P? No, it doesn't. But, so let's go back to our original situation again. P equals M uh, plus five. It does M equal P minus five? So I'll go along P, I'll go back five, and yes, it will reach M. So we can see that this one here is the correct solution. You can also do this on MathSpot. So it, for one I prepared earlier, here we are. Um, for those of you who would, maybe don't have a visualizer in your classroom, you can use MathSpot. And there it is. So M, does P plus five equal M? No, it doesn't. Does M take away five equal P? No, it doesn't. There's all sorts of, um, well, you can do the manipulative in front of the pupils really, really nicely. So MathSpot, I mention it virtually every week, but it's a fantastic resource and good on the fellow who, who created that for us, Jonathan Hall. Um, can I go back to the video? Because I was supposed to. Uh, so from that quiz and air rods, it helped us consider multi multiplicative relationships. And we could see during it that if yellow was two, we'd say orange was four. If yellow was six, then orange was 12. And you can, you can assign them any value you wish. It's a way to introduce commutativity, the, the multi multiplication law of uh, commutativity. We can see that six lots of P is the same as four lots of D. So six lots of four is the same as four lots of six. How can we see that? Because the length is the same. And then you might make that link and realize it's a nice way to show factors. And so the orange, I think, uh, is one lot of 10. Uh, two yellows there, uh, two lots of five. Uh, oh, and then you've got the reds, five lots of two. So we're seeing, uh, we're seeing commutativity, but we're also seeing how to show factors. Are there any other ways of finding 10? No, there aren't. So there are no other factor pairs. This is also a way to introduce addition commutativity because oh, well, I'll go to the example on MathSpot in a moment, uh, but orange equals red plus green plus yellow. Well, let's go to the MathSpot example again. Does P equal five plus M? Yes, it also equals M plus five. Brilliant. And we can show that really quickly, really easily using Cuisinaire rods and using bar models. Uh, if you are interested in Cuisinaire rods, I've been referring to them a couple of times, uh, but yes, do go onto the NCTM website, there's loads of resources there for you. Okay, um, bar models, there's also a lot of resources about bar modeling, uh, and I'm gonna be hopefully modeling those successfully this morning. Now, where do these bar models come from? Uh, I mentioned Singapore for a good reason, uh, that they started um, in investing a lot of time into people being able to use bar models. And this concrete pictorial abstract, so they'd have six counters, six plus three, and then you could represent it as a drawing. Um, there they are, and this bar has been created here. You've got a part of six, a part is three, and the whole is nine, part, part, whole. And this is an example here of a part, part, whole uh, diagram, which is used very early years, I think year one. Uh, 98 is a part, no pardon me, 98 is the whole. 20 is a part of 98, 78 is a part of 98, and the sum of 20 and 78 is 98. And because they've seen this early doors in primary school, there's no reason why we shouldn't be carrying this forward into secondary school, uh, and certainly into key stage two and three and, and four as well. There's plenty of good topics that bar modeling could be used for. You can, of course, have a part, part, part whole model as well. And in this instance, you'll notice all three parts are the same. Now that's interesting because then imagine the whole was 12. Then you'd have a third is four, four and four, three thirds. And you could see four plus four plus four. So 
it's, it, it's there for times tables. It's there for fractions, lots of different things we can use it for. So let's look at another example of part whole. Seven plus two is nine. We can say two plus seven is nine. We can take nine take away seven is two. We can say nine take away two is seven. There's loads of different relationships and we're making those connections between addition and subtraction, making them absolutely explicit. I know it's algebra, but it's no different. We suddenly got A plus B equals C. We've got C take away B equals A. We've got C take away A equals B. I don't think I said B plus A equals C. The relationships are the same. And suddenly we're building a bridge to algebra from things they've done before when they're scared because they've got this math anxiety. Oh, you're using letters, sir. You're using letters, madam. That's, I don't know what you're doing. Well, we're breaking those bridges down by referring back to previous learning. Uh, algebra, you can certainly use it for plenty of equations, and I'm going to try and uh, model a few today. Uh, 2x plus 1 equals 7. I thought I'd put this in a couple of times this morning. Show me what the problem may look like. Don't solve it yet. Don't rush straight to the answer. We've got to train our year sevens if you're if we're talking secondary, but no matter what year group I'm talking to today, train them to find what the problem may look like first. Consider, does that seem to represent the problem correctly? Now let's try and answer it. And I hope that does represent it. Um, we've got a length of seven there and we've got two X's, the variable. And of course you'd have to continue to reiterate that X is a variable. It'll um, be a different number in a different uh, question. It could be a different number in a different question. Um, but, and the length doesn't necessarily represent it fairly as well, which is, uh, which is something you've got to be quite clear about. So does the order matter again? The same question, I could have done one plus two X equals seven. I could have done seven equals one plus two X. I could have asked it as seven equals two X plus one. Do you know when the kids turn around and say, whoa, whoa, wait a second, so you haven't put the X at the start. You put the X on the right-hand side, what do I do? How easy is it with bar models to consider that and to make sure pupils are more confident that these different variations of the same question? Uh, this also is taken from those NCTM, and in fact, a lot of these resources from the equations are taken from this NCTM document, which is available to you. Uh, so this equation here is 3X plus 1 equals X plus 7. I hope we agree. Uh, and what we do here is show maybe the steps. So equality is shown up by lining the bars. So we can see the ends there that, that, that meet up. Equality is shown uh, by lining up the bars. And this depiction leads to the intuitive strategy of cutting off equal sections at either end. When I introduced bar modeling to a year eight class, I put a lot of bar models on the wall and didn't tell them any words. I just said, what does X mean? What's the value of X? And they, intuition is the word on that screen there, intuition right there. They, they looked at it and said, well, x must be the same as x. Uh, I can take away the one just there. So I've got two x must equal six. And they were able to work out just by looking at the bar model. Now, one thing I pointed out earlier on, I think, I think one of our next slides does the same. You've got to do bar modeling alongside the abstract. Play with the bar models, but then make sure you're re representing what you're doing in the bar model. Let's represent it with the abstract. So we're making those links and it's a bridge to the abstract. It's certainly not a replacement for it. Aha, here we go, model alongside the abstract. It's as if I knew I was gonna, what I was going to do. 2a plus 3 equals a plus 7. And I'd write that down there. We can see they're equal because the lengths are the same on the red lines. Uh, let's take away a from the left-hand side, take it away from the right-hand side. And then you can see the equality. Do you know when we talk about that, I've only taken it away from one side. Well, look what happens in the bar model. I've only taken it away from the one side. Then they're not equal anymore. Now they are. Really powerful way to make sure we make uh, make sure they're doing the same to both sides if that's the way you teach equations. Uh, so we've now got the new equation, a plus three equals seven. I take away three from the one. Oh, I've got to do it from the other side. Look, it's not equal anymore. Now it's equal and I've got a equals four. Really important to do them alongside. A really nice way of modeling the abstract alongside the, um, yeah, modeling <laughs> alongside the abstract. So it's time for you to have a go and for me to check for Manu if there are any questions, because it keeps popping up my screen that there have been 48 remarks and I don't read them. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a moment to try drawing these. If you have got MathSpot open, feel free to try and create them. I'm just gonna give you a few moments and give people a chance to ask questions if there are any so far, Adam. Yeah, so um, what is the best way um, to get students to think more slowly? and show what the problem may look like as opposed to them just diving in straight away? Um, I think, well, just like anything with pupils, we've got to train them. And on a personal note, and I, can't, um, I have had to repeat it numerous times at the start saying, I don't want the answer. No one even dare give me the answer. Only hold, and, and I suppose this is where whiteboard's really powerful. Because if anyone put the whiteboard up with the answer, I tell them to rub it up. So that's not what I asked you for. 
And you've just got to be really explicit, just like anything when we train pupils about certain routines. Maths are, there's an expression I like to use, the answer is only the beginning. Um, again, from the Glow Maths Hub lead, Steve Lomax, the first person I heard to set, use that. And I don't, the answer is, you know, we're not just trying to get to the answer. The, the problem with maths somehow, sometimes when we teach it, is people think, I've got to get to the answer, I've got to get to the answer. Oh, that matters now. Well, that's not the important. The important part is the conceptual understanding of how we got there, the relational understanding that Skemp refers to. Do you understand how we got there? Because if I give you a different question with different numbers, would you be able to do it? Well, if you didn't know what you were doing or why you were doing it, you might not be able to. Uh, and so how do you do that? I think you'd be absolutely explicit. Represent this problem. Do not answer it. And I suppose, again, with whiteboards, you can check the whole classroom to make sure that they're doing as you've asked them to do. Um, but get them to rub it out. There'll be one kid, there always is, who will answer the question. Tell them to rub it out. So that's not what I asked you for, because you're training them to be mathematicians. You're not training them to... Um, yeah, you've been quite, uh, you can be quite explicit here and say, look, you're trained to be mathematicians so that they can go on to do well in all exams and, and answer all questions and answer all problems. You're not training them to pass the exam. You're training them to be better for, uh, thinkers. See the question, represent it. Does that look right? Now's the time to, to solve it. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Anymore? awesome. And um, we've had this before in previous sessions, but obviously when we extend this to negatives and powers give and me five roots. minutes give me five awesome minutes. okay and then one final one could you quickly show how to use um these again on maths bot yep i'll tell you what i'll do the first one on maths bot now so we've got three yeah. a plus one equals seven um there are loads of uh, maths bots the one I'm, I'm doing today because it's um it's free uh, i do like a website called braining camp which is free at the moment actually um, right, 3a plus 1 equals 7. In fact, he's put a new feature in, uh, which is great. Uh, and again, Jonathan Hall at, at Study Maths. If you ever want to send him a message, do so. Uh, so let's get three, bar, three bars, and there they are. I'm also going to create a, a new one. No, I'm not great at this, I'm not going to lie, but let's label, label all of those. Brilliant. I'm going to copy one below. Now, can I reduce that? I think I can. Yes. And I want to reduce its length. And I'm going to add it to the end. Cool. So I've created three eight uh, plus one. This copy here, and I can then uh, alter its length. I hope. <laughs> oh no, the other way. Let's just try and move that across. Now, actually, there's one thing about this. Oh, they're all labelled. Oh, that's why I've got to change it. Right. So let's do that to there. My mistake. My apologies. Move that to there. There we go. Okay. Can you see it highlighted red when I changed it? Um, one thing I want to point out about this, and this will be a fear for some of the people listening, you don't have to use the uh, math bot to do this. You might find drawing it is a lot quicker. And as a matter of fact, actually, my plan was to, to model these by drawing them um, because there's that fear that it takes a little bit long in the class. Now, admittedly, I can screenshot that now or, or screen clip it and put it into my PowerPoint. Um, but actually modeling it for them has its huge purpose as well, using a visualizer or doing it on the board so they can recreate that. So if I go back to these questions, um, I'll, I'll recreate the next ones of those. So let me just make a note of them because we've only just done the one together there. Uh, in fact, you know what? I'm probably moving on, just giving people a chance to do that unless I get shouted at. Otherwise, uh, can we create a couple of these? So I'll, I'll, I'll do that as a drawing thing because actually modeling you doing it, it, it probably better than doing it on, on math spot, actually. I would, I would suggest it, it, it would be better. Uh, so let's have a look. Those are the two questions there. Um, let's do 3a and it maybe just shows that you don't have to be perfect with it now i'm messy don't i am really messy uh but i've got I've, i'm going to extend that box down because i've got the a i know the a's are equal so it's worth me doing it that way actually uh and i know that equals seven i've got the equal sign here got the equals there they're the same length and so i've, I've been able to create that the next one five plus three a so let's call that five. Let's break this into three uh, three separate ones. Again, I did promise you I was messy. Uh, I've got an A on both sides, so I'm going to extend that down. I think that's important. Again, I'm showing that the A has the same value, uh, an A plus seven. And let's, let's solve that next one. So let's change color. That's the same color, I think. I think they're both green. <laughs> so that extension down here, if that area is five, well, let's just make a quick part, part, whole. If this whole length is seven, and five is apart, two is apart as well. So if we've got rid of that five, 
the two, so I've now got two A equals two. What am I doing horrendously wrong at this stage? I wasn't um, solving it alongside. And so, you know, to model my own beliefs, let's do three A equals A plus seven. And now let's do the whole process. A, A, A. So I've got 3A equals A plus 7. Interesting, I've done 7 plus A. Does it matter, pupils? No, why not? Addition is commutative. Great, let's carry on. Um, I'm going to take away A from both sides. I take away A from that side and take away A from that side. And what am I left with? Now, some people like to do this. Redraw the model. So what's my new equation? I've got 2A. Oops, well, that is right. 2A equals 7. Oh, I've used a, a non-integer answer. Okay, um, that means I'm going to cut it in half. Now, this is addition. Some of these two numbers, they're the same. They add to be 7. I suppose we are dividing by 2, though. So I'm dividing both sides by 2. And I've got A equals 3.5. Now, just as one of the, uh, we'll go ahead and we'll talk about problem solving. The fourth step of George Pollier's um, How to Solve It is check it, check your answer. And going back to your que uh, the question we had before about um, how do you make them stop? Well, we insist upon it. Well, you have it on the wall somewhere, the four steps of problem solving, although there's, there's, there's some people who share eight steps, which I'm also gonna look at later on. Let's look back at this. Does 3.5 plus 3.5 equal seven? Yes, it does. Let's go back to the very first question. I've got 3a equals a plus seven. Does three lots of 3.5 equal 3.5 plus 7. And actually checking your answer, we know that's an incredibly important skill for mathematicians. Uh, and that's what we're creating from our pupils. We're not creating pupils, we don't want to create pupils who are just getting it right. We're trying to create mathematicians. Let's keep going. Uh, Al, there you go, equations with negatives. Now 2x uh, take away 3 equals 5. This is when I turn around and say the right representation for the right situation. Uh, we've done algebra tiles in previous weeks. Uh, and there's an example of the algebra tiles. 2x, 3 negative 1s equals 5. And you'd add 3 to both sides to make 0 pairs. There is, of course, other ways of looking at it. And these quotes are taken from the NCTM guidance. When solving equations containing a negative term, such as the one I seem to have already stolen, the bar model diagram is derived from an understanding of the structure of the calculation on a number line. This is what I did a little bit earlier on. So we go 2x is along, and then we go 3 back and that length would then be five. And that's where that, that bar models come from there. So some people don't like that. So that's why I maybe go back to the idea of choose what representation you prefer. Some people might be very comfortable with this, but uh, there is of course an empty box method. And this is, uh, um, I once taught a Chinese student and he told me that uh, when he was brought, uh, brought up, there was nothing about doing the same to both sides. He was very much looking at it this way. If two X take away three equals five, well, hold on a second. Just look at that question, forget the, the X's, just look at that question alone. It's a primary school question that says square, or box, take away three equals five. Well, what take away three equals five? Well, it's eight. So two X must equal eight. And you go on from there. Use of reasoning. It, it's not following rules, actually it's just, how does it make sense? Really nice way of solving things. What about equations with a negative solution? Well, the limitations of bar models, again, the right representation for the right situation. Um, again, one of my favorite trading sessions ever, I get told off because it doesn't work for everything bar models. No, it doesn't. The right representation for the right situation. Uh, the limitations of bar model diagrams become apparent when representing equations with negative solutions. There's no sensible diagram can be drawn. Let's try it. 2x plus 11 equals five. Let's give it a go. That's what it would look like. Does look odd, doesn't it? Now, I'm taking this quote again. While in some ways this can be required, uh, regarded as a clear indicator that x has a negative value, if students don't recognize this, then it can be hard for them to know where to begin. So yes, the right representation for the right situation. Use of the bar model in the positive solutions, however, should provide a tool for supporting students in making generalizations. And that's the point of concrete pictorial abstract. The, the, the generalizations that we learned earlier on uh, to help us with solutions later on. And bearing in mind, of course, the more we're looking at it, certainly with the, the, educate, um, the EIF doc, uh, guidance um, with regards to creating lessons, it's one learning point at a time. And we do equations with positive integers to start. Then in a separate lesson, 
equations with a negative solution maybe. Not trying to do it all together in one go, breaking it down into manageable easy chunks and we could refer back to the previous lesson and say, well, what are we gonna do with this question? And be able to refer back. The right representation for the right situation. Going to move on to number. Uh, this is a brilliant website. I, I referred to uh, William Emery's website before when I was looking at algebra tiles. Again, the link, every link and every reference I use today will be put at the end of the session. Uh, but bar modeling, when he clearly met it, and look at what he did it as well. Boxing Day, 2014. He was that excited on Boxing Day. He wanted to share this to the world, and it's a great website, and I'll share that with you later on. Uh, before I start number, though, any questions, Adam? Um, just one. So using the empty box method, yep. how would you encourage students to show their work in? If I know, then I know. Um, obviously, it's a slightly different topic today, and half of me was going to remove that question um, because it goes off topic. But go on, let's do it. Uh, let's replace it with the, the unknown. You cover up the unknown. So I've covered up the unknown. What do I know? If I know... I mean, you could have it as a sentence. This would be completely up to you. I think maybe taking your time to slow kids down isn't a bad thing. And I struggle with slowing down because I'm excitable. Um, if I know eight take away three equals five, um, and two X take away three equals five, therefore two X must equal eight. I think that, 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 that why not? Stem sentences maybe, offering stem sentences. If I know, and I know, therefore I know. Um, yeah, slow, slow kids down. It's um, it, it's hard, and I am just a big kid. Um, but yeah, I think I think, that's, <laughs> I think that's the way I'd go about it. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, let's go through some representations. I said at the start that uh, bar modeling is great for problem solving, but it's also good for again for representing the maths, representing the maths, and showing the structure and showing relationships. So simplifying fractions. Let's look at write uh, write four sixths in its simplest form, and you can see four parts, four equal parts out of six parts here, and remove some of the vertical lines to make fewer equal sized pieces, very important. So four six in its simplest form is two thirds. Now again, this would be really good with Cuisinair rods, and in fact there's a video that helps us, so what we'll do is click to there, click to here, and look at this video to help us on this situation, two minutes long. How do Cuisinair rods make effective models for decimals and fractions? Let's find out. You can assign a value of your choice to any single rod. You can then identify the values of the other rods by using the relationships between them. For example, if you give the orange rod a value of 1, then the white, red and light green rods have values of 0 0.1 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, respectively. Now students can model decimal calculations using the rods. Alternatively, if we give the red rod a value of one third, then dark green, white, light green and yellow rods have a value of one, one sixth, one half and five sixths, respectively. We can then use the rods to show equivalent fractions. For example, we can see that two reds are equal to four whites, so two thirds is equivalent to four sixths. Students can also use the rods to model fraction calculations. For example, yellow is equal to dark green subtract white, so five sixths is equivalent to one subtract one sixth. The rods are particularly useful for highlighting common misconceptions. Here, the rods clearly show that one half plus one third is just less than one whole. In fact, it is equal to five sixths. Once students are confident with these relationships, they can explore decimals and fractions further. Okay, uh, again, a, re a reminder that uh, all those videos, uh, in fact, let's go to the NCTM website. I think it's, do I have it open? Maybe I don't. Uh, but these documents here are available on the NCTM website. And uh, I, I speak openly that I, I've tried with Cuisinair rods. I'd love to use them more. Um, I think my own fear of colors kind of slows me down a little bit. Um, but I suppose the example there was very much linked to um, fraction walls. And that's what it is. It's an extension. It's just a movable version of it. 
let's keep going. Um, oh, just to remind yourself from those, because I think it did a little bit quickly. Um, if I know that red equals a third, uh, then I know that D equals one. I, I think it's just really nice to compare these to fraction walls and that idea of uh, two thirds here being the same as four sixths. You can see, I, I really like that example of five sixths. Um, one take away a sixth is five sixths. I just thought it was worth reflecting on that just for, for a second longer. Uh, some other examples of where bond modeling is not about problem solving as such necessarily, um, but let's have a look at this. Convert two and a third into an improper fraction. Uh, you can use Cuisinaire rods, and uh, I did that. And the reason I wanted to make sure I showed that screen, that's from MathSpot. So that's how I maybe played with the Cuisinaire rods online. And I put that dotted line there to remind you, uh, to show you that we've got one hole, one hole. This hole's been broken up into three equal parts, into a third. And how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you can play with Cuisinaire rods on MathSpot as well. It's a fantastic website. Place value in decimal numbers. So 0.6. Well, if you've shown them uh, using number lines, or whatever it might be, it's an extension of a number line, 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and so on and so forth. Um, I read one thing uh, that said, I think I said this in a previous session, that should we say 0 0.1 or we should be saying 0 and 1 tenth, 0 and 2 tenths, 0 and 3 tenths, 0 and 4 tenths, 5 tenths, 6 tenths. I think that's really interesting. We'll certainly remind us about our place values. But if 0.6, I'll go back to that, if 0.6 looks like this, 0 0.7 would look like that. So 0 0.62, we can break that into 10 little chunks in between. We can see very quickly that 0 0.62 is greater than 0 0.6, but it is smaller than 0 0.7. Fractions to decimals and vice versa. So um, why is 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 tenths? Why is it half of one? Well, it's one of two equal parts. One of two equal parts. Three of 10 equal parts. 0.3, three tenths. Two of five equal parts, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. Each one is a fifth, two of five equal parts. Fractions of amounts. So really nice way of introducing fractions of amounts. Uh, so 20, I've got five equal parts. Each must be a fifth of fifth. Um, draw a rectangle to show its length is 20. Split into fifths, shade in three of them. Well, how long is one gonna be? Well, it's gonna be four. Total length of three fifths, three lots of four. Let's look at that a little bit again. Let this make some connections in maths as well, uh, because five lots of four is 20. So with your times tables, what a lovely way of uh, referring back to your times tables and making that link that a fifth of 20 equals four. So three fifths must equal 12. And of course, division as well, very clearly there, 20 divided into five equal boxes, each equal box must equal four. And it's that, I, I think I've spoken about it. If I know, then I know, I know I did it with, with, with that uh, empty box, but there's a superb resource on can do maths. If I know four times seven is 28, I know that 28 divided by four is seven. I know 28 divided by seven equals four. I know a quarter of 28 equals seven. I know a seventh of 20, and I should have done this with Dan, I apologize. What I'll do is um, at the very end, I'll try and make sure I show that. It's a really nice secondary ready um, example. In fact, I'll do it on next week's session. I'll, I will do that on next week's session, so I'll do it then. Um, percentage of an amount, finding 10%. So establish, of course, maybe this was a little bit quick because I did this before, but you've got to establish that 10% is tenths. There are 10 equal lots of 10% and there they are. Uh, and we can see each block, if the whole lot is 50, each one will be worth five meters. But if 10% is five meters, we can then have discussions. What would 5% be? What would 20% be? And you can see what's going on and understand what small part of it 10% is, how big a part 80% is in comparison. Gonna get you to have a go with this, uh, the one after this. So watch this one very carefully. Uh, decrease 50 meters by 25%. So we can see the whole thing is 50 meters. I've broken them into 10 equal parts of five meters. Uh, what is 0.75? Well, using multi multiplicative reasoning, two and a half blocks is 12.5 meters. So to, so to decrease an amount, you've got your original amount and percentages, and I'm going to get you to have a go in a second. And I'm doing it a little bit quickly, but it's, it's kind of that way maybe I've got to do it on a, an online session. Um, you've always got your 100% first. You represent your 100% on a bar, and then what are we doing? Are we adding or are we taking away? Um, and so I'm going to ask you to have a go at this. Super Mario, oh, look at that spelling mistake. I can't have that. I, I just sit uncomfortable with it. Let me just get rid of that. There we go. A Super Mario game. Um, the, game the word game doesn't need to be capital letters. Do you know what? I'm going to be pedantic about it. 
that's who I am. I, you know, in front of students, I wouldn't allow it, so I'm not going to allow it in front of you either. A Super Mario game costs £48. It is reduced in price by 25%. How much does it cost now? Can you please represent this problem? Do not answer it. I want you to represent the problem. Do not answer it. You, people I always have to repeat it to, do not answer it. Give you a moment. Now, I know previously I used blocks of 10%. Do we have to? I purposely left the last slide as it was to see how many people don't go for 10% blocks. Okay, another 10, 10 seconds. Any questions or abuse, by the way, Adam? Uh, da, 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 da. Filter out the abuse. Yeah. <laughs> no, not really, not at the moment. Cool, thank you. Uh, how much does it cost now? Let's represent it. You can represent it in lots of different ways, but this is what I've chosen. The game, the whole lot is 48. I put it into four equal blocks. I did, you don't have to do it into 10% because this makes perfect sense. Of course, I want people to recognize that there are four lots of 25%. And earlier on, I made reference to the fact of don't rush into using these, get kids to play with bar modeling. And at this stage, I'll mention the maths hubs um, because there are loads of different groups that each maths hub does. And in the embedding mastery course, one of the work groups I re lead, we're looking at how to introduce bar models. Interestingly, the year five to eight continuity group is also looking at that. So getting involved with work groups in the NCTM and your local maths hub, um, a nice way of we're, we're both focusing, there's loads of different groups, we're both focusing on how do we introduce bar models. And if, if it's successful, it's something I'll, show in, I'll, I'll share in a, a future session. But I've represented the problem here. I've said, what is there? There's a game. The whole thing is £48, reduced by 25%, and that means I've got four equal blocks. I want to know what three equal blocks equals. And you can see very quickly, if it's four blocks of 48, uh, that equal 48, pardon me, we want the value of three boxes. So we find the value of one, which is 12, and multiply by three. We're visualizing the problem before we solve it. And we know, we can see it's going to be smaller. And even if you then gave me an answer of 12 pounds, I said, hold on a second, how much does it cost now? Does 12 pounds look right? Reverse percentages are going, going to show you one example and I'm going to have a go at this one afterwards as well. A tablet computer is reduced by 10%. So we'll again have a 100% bar and then we might have a after bar. So before and after, 100%. In fact, I think in this example, he's put them together. So the original price, we don't know it. But 90%, I know that 90% equals 180. Now, if I know 90% equals 180, I've got, sorry, I did that too quickly, uh, nine blocks here equals 180, that means one block must be 20 pounds. How quickly is that? How quick that I've got another block here, just add that back on, the original price is 200. I think, I think it's absolutely fascinating the first time you meet these things. You have a go. A jacket was reduced in a sale by 20%. How many blocks are you gonna put in? It now costs 40 pounds, what was the original price? Some bad grammar there. A little question for you to maybe think about, Tom. Go for it. How would you do compound interest? Uh, it's on that William Emery blog. Uh, I won't do it for time, but I'll just send you to the blog. There's a nice example of it on there. Just copy it into the chat. Uh, yeah, I'll drop, you, I'll drop all the, the references and things right at the end. Awesome. Okay, so it is possible, definitely. Before, after, after. Okay. So it was reduced in a sale by 20%. Oh, I should have said the word, shouldn't I? Represent the problem. And let's represent it. So if I know that the new cost was 40 pounds, well, what was the original? So you can see I've done the whole bar here, the question mark, you could have done it as two separate bars if you wish, the, the original and then the after maybe. Uh, I put them together here, the jackets. So if I've got four blocks, why have I got five blocks? Well, I was reduced by 20%, and because I practiced this, and because it was introduced to me doing bar models over and over, I know five lots of 20 is 100, five lots of 20%, so there's the whole, and I only lost one of those blocks, 
So four blocks is 40, each block must be worth 10, therefore the original price must be 50. Just want to show a couple of examples of when you can use bars or blocks uh, and show you why I think it's really powerful. This is a, from an Excel textbook um, in this quadrilateral. So we know all the angles inside add up to 360. Uh, angle PSR, so where is that? PSR is over here, is four sevenths of QRS. So I've, I've done this. For, if there are four blocks of PSR, there are seven blocks for QRS. Oh, pardon me. I also know that angle QPS, here it is, six sevenths of QRS, of PQR, oh, oh, have I got this wrong? I might have to go back to this and check, that's interesting. Um, I'm gonna carry on pretending it's right, but I need to, oh, I'm gonna have to be careful on this one. Uh, 24 blocks in total, I've written, 360 divided by 24, there are 24 blocks here, so each block must be worth 15. I've got, I'm, now, I'm now worried because I think I've done that wrong, wow. And I've done this presentation before, no one's ever noticed. Um, let me show you why I prefer the blocks. Look at the algebra involved. Look at the algebra involved here. X plus X plus four sevenths X plus six sevenths X. Oh, they're equal angles, that's why. I remember now, okay, so that is fine. What I've done is fine. Um, but look at the algebra involved here. That's so unpleasant. Yeah, it'd be nice if the kids can do it. We can relate it to that afterwards, but if they can have a concept of what's going on and the comparison of sizes, and you've given them a tool to do it, well, that's fantastic. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Um, I, I referred to this website earlier on, uh, this, this blog, find the mean of these numbers, and there they are. Now, admittedly, I should have done them as uneven blo blocks. I've put them as the same size, but the whole length of that is 30. And if I want the mean average, that means I'm sharing them equally amongst all groups. So I've got this situation. I've got 30 separated equally into five groups. So it must be six. Isn't that nice? I think that's lovely. Um, another example from Mr. D. Busby's website, and then I'll move on. At a nursery, the mean age of four children is 31 months. Uh, Katie joins the nursery, and now the mean age of all children is 30 months, before and after. So I've got four blocks of 31, because of the mean in reverse, if you like, there'd be a total of 124. The afterwards situation would be a total of 150. So let's just make sure I put the arrows on there and put the numbers on. Okay, just take a second to pick that up. We're being asked, the question mark, what, what the age of Katie is. Well, the difference between the two, um, the before and after situation is 26. So Katie must be 26. So let's look at the benefits of model drawing. Students have a visual to associate with numbers that can be also can be abstract, so they can see what 40% means in comparison to 80%, be used to the fact it's out of 100. Students start to see the relationship behind these numerical values. Remember that we learn these letters, these A, B, C, D, and when you're learning French and German, you're learning the pronunciations. They're learning a new language when they see maths, and each symbol, what it represents. And that's what I like about, uh, I think about these drawings. It translates the English into math. They read a sentence, can they translate it into a problem? And then maybe back into the English and prepare, comparing back and forth. And by doing this, we're giving pupils at least one strategy of solving many different types of problems. Now going back to the improving mathematics in key stage two and three, recommendation three was teach pupils strategies for solving problems, brilliant. And if pupils lack a well-rehearsed, so you take your time over it, readily available method to solve a problem, uh, they need to draw on problem solving strategies to make sense of an unfamiliar situation. So uh, when we look at the third assessment objective of the national curriculum, unfamiliar situations, well, can they represent it to make it easy? It requires people to monitor, reflect on, and communicate their problem solving. So again, the fact they can do it themselves, they will be reasoning about it, they'll be talking about it, and that reflection there, does it look right? So we'll go to, we're looking at more problem solving now. This article is uh, Mathematics Teaching. If you're an ATM uh, member, you'll receive this, but actually they tweeted this one for free this week. Very good timing, given the session I was doing. Colin Foster reflects on dilemmas in teaching students how to solve mathematical problems. It seems to me that scaffolding the problem is not what we should be doing. Scaffolding a problem inevitably diminishes the problem solving aspect. That's really interesting. How often do we say, well, you've got to do two times seven here, so, so, so what's two times five? Yep, so what do we do? Um, easy example, I know. Um, but giving them similar situations, is that really useful for them? Are we helping them become a problem solver or are we just helping them with the maths in that question? It can be a short term aid to solving that particular problem. It doesn't future proof students in preparation for problems they have not met yet. And again, going back to that question earlier on, we train the pupils to take their time and think, I don't want the answer. 
because I'm making you a mathematician. I'm giving you skills that will help you in the future. So um, some other nice quotes from this, this, this really good article. Uh, what we need to be doing is scaffolding the problem solving. Now that's very different, not scaffolding the problem, but scaffolding the problem solving. And when we scaffold the problem, we direct students' attention to that particular feature. Um, I'm gonna look at that in a little bit later on. Uh, when we scaffold the problem, we direct students' attention. I don't know, did that come up, up, up on screen there, Adam, the results? Yeah, sorry. I'm, no, I, that's all right. I just want to make sure people knew what I was talking about when I said that. Um, so let's just go back a second, sorry. When we scaffold the problem, we direct students' attention to particular features of the specific problem that they're working on. So it's not directing them to the maths they've got to do for that little bit, because that's not useful. We're trying to scaffold the problem solving aspect, not the problem. What we need to do is uh, scaffold the problem. Yeah, um, I don't know why that's come up again. Uh, when we scaffold the problem solving, we give more generic support, which is intended to help students when they meet other similar problems in the future. And that's the point, isn't it? So uh, within the article, he, he refers to Alan Schoenfeld, uh, Schoenfeld, who offers three generic questions to ask students whenever they're stuck on a problem. Really nice, these. Uh, what exactly are you doing? Can you describe it precisely? Again, reasoning. Why are you doing it? How does it fit into the solution? This goes very nicely with what George Polly will talk about in a moment. And how does it help you? What will you do with the outcome when you obtain it? And so we're thinking about the problem solving scaffolding here, not the problem. And that's really, really different, really different. And again, it goes back to that sentence, the answer is only the beginning. The methods are the ones we want because the answer is only the answer to that particular question doesn't help us for a future one necessarily. So George Polly's problem solving method from how to solve it broke it down into four quite easy steps. Step one, understand the problem. So who does it involve? What does it involve? Devise a plan, decide how you're going to answer it, but don't answer it yet. You, know, you notice no one's tried to solve anything yet. Understand the problem and devise the plan. Then carry out the plan, then check your answer. We referred to this a little bit earlier on. So let's look at that devise a plan. There might be different ways that you, you create your plan. You might make a list of things. You might look for a pattern. Think, okay, I could try that in a moment. Not yet, I won't try it yet. I'm just looking for a pattern. I make suppositions, I make suggestions and conjectures as to what I might do, what might happen. I solve part of the problem because that will help me. Um, very often I talk to pupils and I use the expression, get the first mark. There's a five mark problem. Most kids are interested in the answer, the fifth mark. How about the first mark? Because the first mark leads to the second. The second mark leads to the third. Hashtag get the first mark. All right. Because if you can get that, it leads to the next bit. And then also one mark is better than none. Uh, many kids who don't like problems, they go, no, nope, next page. If you've got the one mark, you've got one mark more than a lot of people in the country. Act it out in a drama. Why not? But there's the one that I'm going to use now. Draw a picture. Uh, devise a plan. Well, how about drawing a picture? And that, of course, is what we're doing today about bar modelling. Uh, that's Yip Ban Ha, one of my other two, uh, my two, well, I always say my two maths gurus, my, my two maths um, people I just look up to, uh, one of the main speakers for Maths No Problem. Uh, bar modelling, um, I can't see because, uh, <laughs> sorry, because it's come up on the screen. Uh, bar modelling helps pupils to tackle part of problem solving as it encourages pupils to visualise the concept before the abstract maths is attempted. Slow them down. Using bar models provides students with opportunities to communicate their reason, uh, understanding of the problem using a visual representation. That came from this book I'm holding up here. It got lots of different questions of how to try it. Uh, it was a quite useful way of me trying to get my head around bar modeling when I started. Let's go back to this question we saw earlier on uh, that was in that research from 2004. And I mentioned it before, how many pupils would go straight to 5 8 to 240 to get the answer? That is the key. The question mark before we try and solve it. I want you to represent the problem first. Now we're going to try and solve it. And the steps to draw models. Now, if you just type this in, you will find loads of people who have suggested loads of steps to drawing these models. There's loads of them out there. Uh, some taken from America, some from around the world. Read the entire problem. Rewrite the question, maybe. Determine who or what. Draw the bars. Chunk the problem. Fill in the question mark. Correctly compute and make sure it makes sense. Poly is step four. Check it. There's another one here, eight steps of model drawing. Read the whole problem. Who is involved in the problem? No one's solving it yet. What is involved in the problem? Draw unit bars, read each sentence, question mark. 
now solve it. The reason I'm taking my time to read these is not to be irritating and boring, is to point out that we've got a lot of things to do before we try and solve it. We're building mathematicians. We're not trying to get right answers. Eight steps of model drawing. There it is again. Number seven is work computation. Look at all the steps until we begin. Step one and step two for polya. Look at those things again. Number six, fill in your question mark. Andrew Jeffrey, if you follow him, uh, loads of great stuff he does. Look at this. He's created this idea, which you can buy from him, uh, that you put onto each table to remind all the kids of the steps. So this might be another way for that question we had earlier on to slow them down. You put them on the table. You can buy those from his website. Now, if you notice, that one there, put the question mark, was on all of them. And the one afterwards was then solve it. Look at all those steps. So I'm going to model this. Um, in fact, you know, I'm going to tell you the shocking statistic already. This was question 16, 2008 at Excel. You can see it in the bottom right. Uh, and this is the shocking statistic. The average for question A, the average score across the country was 1.02 out of 2. Mean average. The mean average score for at Excel for question 3, question B, sorry, was under 1 out of 3. Now let's do the question using bar modeling, using representation. And you're going to be a little bit disgusted at those marks because I was incredibly shocked when I looked at them. So going back a screen, I say concrete pictorial abstract. Let's do it. Let's do this one with concrete pictorial abstract. I'm going to get the question on screen so you can see it. There it is. OK, so Alan, uh, Bispar and Chan share a sum of money. Now, Alan gets one eighth. Now, if he gets one eighth, that means there's going to be eight parts here. Now, I've chosen to go with um, the concrete manipulative just because I thought it'd be fun. I like doing different things. OK, let's move it across so you can see everything. If Alan equals one eighth, we may be converting to a bar model afterwards. Bispar gets half the money. Now, I can see there are eight of these. So Bispar gets four parts and Chan gets the rest. Awesome. Oh, ABC. Who'd have thunk it? All right, if Alan gets £2.50... So if that one of them equals £2.50, what do I now know? I know this one equals £2.50 and this one equals £2.50. I'm not going to try and solve anything yet, by the way. But if I know one of these blocks is £2.50, I know all of these is £2.50. Now, I think I did something very clever earlier on. I tried to practice. Aha! I'm hoping now that's going to be a little bit available. So let's go back to one of these. I've read the problem. Who is in the problem? We've got Alan. Bisbar and Chan, they're all mentioned. What's the problem talking about? Well, they're talking about part, uh, eight parts and one of them equals £2.50. Read the problem one sentence at a time. Fix your picture as you go. Well, I did do that, but I also then started, what do I also know? Put the question mark in the drawing. So what's the question? Find out how much Bispar makes, okay? So, da 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 da, da. Oh, well, I, I've kind of already answered that. It's a tenner. The, the average mark, what did I say? 1.02 out of two across the whole country. Um, shocking. Find the ratio, the amount of money Alan gets to the amount of money Chan gets. Really? F find the ratio from Alan to Chan. One to three. That is three marks. I am going to give that some exclamation points. That was three marks. And you can see it so easily. I'm going to talk at a really high pitch to make this really clear how shocked I am. That's five marks. There you go. <clears throat> but look at that question there. <laughs> I, I can't believe that question is worth five marks. And look how easy it is and how easy it is to access with a bar model. Let's just go back to this really quickly, by the way. Um, and if you were just to go bar modeling, it would have been something like this, I would imagine. Uh, so if you've got Alan, you may have done it like this. Um, you told that's one of eight, eight points. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yes, I've got eight points. I'm going to move the A to there. I was told that Chan was half of them, so that's four out of the eight. Now I can see that, uh, was it Bispar? That was four of them. I can fill that in as £2.50, so I know all of them are £2.50. That's how simple the bar model might be. Some people might do it like this. Okay, my natural instinct is this one because it was one of eight parts, but actually you can still see there are eight parts in total just there. I'll talk about consistency in a bit, actually, whether it's important or not. OK, uh, we're not that long to go. Jamie, my, my nephew, ate 10 meatballs at the Christmas party. Florence, my niece, ate three times as many meatballs as Jamie. How many meatballs did they eat all together? 
There it is represented. Florence have three times as many. That's really important. That's, that's, that's quite nice to visualize there. And so Jamie's block is worth 10. Well, Florence has got three blocks. So she had 30. How many did they all together? Do you notice where the question mark is? Now I can solve the question that it equals 40. It's gone quarter past. Adam, you've got to go to your birthday party. I do. Um, I've made Miss Sandring host, so she'll take over. Thank you, Miss Sandring, and happy birthday, Adam. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. So, thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, Jamie eight ten. Uh, Florence ate three times as many. We can see the mul multiplicative structure very, very quickly in the comparison. Imagine if that question had said, "How many more meatballs did Florence have?" You'd see the difference there. Really useful. Before they answer the question, where's the question mark? Before you answer the question, where's the question mark? So your turn. Sam has nine times as many football cards as Helen. Together they have 150 cards. How many more cards does Helen have than Sam? Okay, so just give you a moment to have a read, or have a go at that, create that yourself. We are gonna finish by half past. Definitely, don't worry, I won't go past it. Da 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 Yes, yes, well spotted people. I love it. You're reading the question. How many more cards does Sam have than Helen? Excellent. Oh, actually, yeah, I think I've done it wrong when it comes to the drawing now, but well done, everybody. You were reading the question. You were paying attention. I was being a sneaky teacher. <laughs> Should we just get on with it? No, no, I've made a mistake. Um, other way around, my apologies. Uh, that should say Helen has nine times as many. You can see the drawing. Hopefully you've got the idea, though. I do apologize. Um, so Sam here, I'm completely confused myself, but we see there's nine blocks here and one block here. So the difference is eight blocks. Now, all of the blocks equal 150. So there were 10 blocks, aren't there? 10 blocks in total so each block works 50 is 15 the difference between them is 130 but yes I, 120 oh there's a mistake on the bottom as well oh dear i'm going to just take that out next time that's just awful so how teachers can use bar modeling to allow for pupils to access the structure of the maths to support their understanding okay we've seen that with number we've seen that about representing the equations as well remember it's not a replacement the abstract we said about doing it alongside nor is it a replacement to any algorithm it's to support the understanding of the algorithm conceptual understanding it's the first assessment of objective fluency in your national curriculum and to give pupils a tool to solve problems and increase reasoning skills think about when i was manipulating with the um with the blocks and with the with the uh, cuisinaires earlier on i'm able to move and talk about them so you have them in pairs in your classrooms and talk about well if i move this what happens well, if one of these represents let's say 10 what would do four represent and they can be talking about they become independent learners as we had from that jewelry quote a little bit earlier on is consistency needed well i showed two examples of bar models earlier uh, and this was uh, i found from a blog somewhere and look at all those different ways of showing 140 take away 96. Now, do we need consistency? Actually, many people would say yes. I'd argue, really? I think you've got an opportunity for a great conversation with children there. What's the same between all of these? What's, this, what's different between all of these? And then you're really getting them to completely not just follow a pattern of a bar model even. They're discussing, well, you can see the bigger part is 140. And there's a small part of 96. And we're trying to find out what the other small part is. And that would be the distance from 96 to 140. And of course, I know you could relate that to a number line as well. Uh, so is consistency needed? Um, it'd be nice. But if people did something differently, compare them. Hold up the two whiteboards at the front of the classroom and ask the children to compare them. They're talking about mathematics, what's wrong with that? So what are the next steps for you? Make yourself familiar with the benefits of bar modeling to support understanding and the different topics it can be used in. So again, I'm gonna be sending you uh, all the links at the end. Look at those blogs that I use, look at the NCTM materials and see the different topics it can be used. And again, the person who asked about compound interest, that's on Will William Emily's blog. Consider how you would introduce these to your classes. So I did try and make a bit, a bit of a fuss about this earlier on. You don't just go straight into bar modeling. 
occasionally you might, uh, but I would take your time when you meet your year seven, take your time to introduce each of them, introduce what's going on um, and what they represent and how we're going to use them in the classroom for five years. If you make your year seven learners happy with bar modeling, your year eight learners are happy with it. Therefore, they, they are still happy in year nine, 10, 11. The problem that some people turn around and say is, if I show this to year 10 and 11, they think it's babyish. Well, that's because you didn't do it in year seven, eight and nine. Do you want it to be a regular feature? This needs to be planned for. Look at that, people. Three exclamation points. I mean it. Uh, so it's at this stage I want to remind you that teaching for mastery, uh, I, 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 my passion of this has really been developed from my time uh, working with the NCTM. And all math subs are looking for primary and secondary schools to develop their teaching for mastery. And you will earn money for it. You will get, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, you'll decide upon two advocates. They'll work closely with a specialist like me who will come to you and support you for free. In fact, you'll be paid it. Okay, you'll be, you'll be asked to work in your own classrooms, but you'll go along to course as well. Uh, but a specialist like me will come to your school. The advocates will need to be released, I think, at least six times uh, a year, but that's different from each hub, and engage in certain tasks and to support in between each, each event. Uh, we would want leadership to sign up for this because we want them to be engaged with you, really committing to your progress. Uh, I think this might be different in each hub, but you get money, and I think it's at least £2,000 for participating. So if you and a colleague want to take part, you rep, we go onto the NCTM website, I've got the, the, the link at the end. You, your school will be paid, and what that money is for is for you to buy the manipulatives, the things I've been using, the tiles, the, the, the tiles, the, 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 um, the counters. Also, by the way, you can be a specialist like me. The applications are out now. If this interests you and you want to go further into it, go onto the NCTM website. The link, link will be at the end and you can sign up to start being a specialist like me. You don't have to be as enthusiastic as I am. You just might like the mask. So at this stage, I say thank you for tuning in. There's my Twitter handle. Please put things on Twitter to say how much you enjoyed it. If you didn't like it, don't put things on Twitter. Um, my previous sessions can be found on YouTube. Do you want to see what next week is? Are you excited? Look at people already leaving. Um, lesson planning for different key stages. What's the same? What's different? I've got a good friend of mine, Alan, and Helen, who I really get on with. She, she's such fun. Um, she is a, a teaching for mastery specialist in SLE, a maths lead as well. She's on Twitter. Alan has been a head of the department in a mixed attainment school and in a grammar school. Uh, and we're going to just be comparing lesson planning and sharing all sorts of things as to how we plan our lessons.